Hello, this is David Callister with another Time to Remember. In March 1948, the writer Richard Lane contributed an article to Lilliput magazine. It was headed Portrait of a Yorkshire Yogi. The article described its subject as square and stout with a very large head, entirely bald, except for patches of greying hair above the ears. His round, clean-shaven face is pink, but a trifle blotchy. He wears an enormous wing collar and a vast but vast bow tie. Richard Lane was describing the man who liked to be addressed as His Excellency Dr. Sir Alexander Cannon, KGCB, MD, DPM, FRGS. The letters went on after his name. And on today's program, and for the first time on radio, this is the voice of Dr. Alexander Cannon, who died in 1963. In the year 1900, I had to travel to Blackpool and found I had some time on my hands to spare and so walked across the cliffs to Bispam, as it then was those 53 years ago, on that warm, sunny afternoon. On the cliffs was a gypsy's tent, with a queue outside, and I gave it but a fleeting thought, when the old gypsy, Sarah, who was about 90 years of age and known as the Royal Gypsy, for she had been consulted by royalty on several occasions, came toddling after me and asked me to cross her palm with silver, which I did not, as I had only gold in my purse, as in those days one pound notes did not exist. She insisted on my sitting down on the grass and then without any more palaver, prophesied in these words, you will write some famous books. You will travel all over the world. You will invent many things, including what will be called in America the lie detector, and much later the atomic eye. You will, in 40 years' time from now, go to live across the sea at a place beginning with B in the north, and then to a place called B in the south, and shortly afterwards settle for some years in the capital of that country at a place beginning with the letter L. She continued with many revelations for over half an hour, whilst she kept her clients waiting. I bade her adieu. I thought to myself, ah, she has made a mistake. I have a seaside house, Roxholme at Bridlington. I used to have one on the north side, and then now this on the south side. That is what she must be interpreting. My work was then in London, and I suppose that was how she muddled the issue. Of course, the words across the sea, to me, implied America, the continent, the Orient, but I never even gave one moment's fleeting thought to the Isle of Man. I did go abroad, to India, to China and Hong Kong, to Malaya, to Formosa, to Tibet, and later returned to London, having long forgotten the gypsy's prophecy. Then, one day, exactly 40 years later, in 1940 of the year of our Lord. It was ordained that I came to settle in the Isle of Man. And although I had later fixed this for 1939, my war duties delayed me in London until 1940. The date the gypsy had prophesied those 40 years ago 
And then I went to Balamore Castle, a place beginning with B. This castle was requisitioned, and I was moved to Belown, near Castletown, Tom Moore's house, the member of the House of Keys. The other place down south, beginning with the letter B. And less than one year later came an equally unexpected move to Douglas, to my Lauriston estate, the place beginning with the letter L, exactly as the gypsy said. Dr. Alexander Cannon from a recording he made 55 years ago Manx Museum librarian Roger Sims contributed an article on Dr. Cannon for New Manx Worthies. He gives his date of birth as the 4th of August, 1896. In that recording, Cannon begins by saying his encounter with the gypsy took place in 1900, in which case he could be no more than five years old. So his story of that gypsy prediction may or may not have been true. However, the rest of it was. He was a world traveller, certainly. He wrote numerous books, still in demand in some parts of the world, books with titles like The Power Within, The Science of Hypnotism, and The Invisible Influence. And as he said, he did come to the Isle of Man to live at Balamore, Bilown, and Lauriston. In today's programme, we hear from some of the people who knew Dr. Cannon, beginning with Eva Kane. Eva was still a teenager and helping her parents in their hotel, uh, when Cannon first arrived on the island. It was when we were in Falcon Cliff in uh, 1939, we received a letter from um, this Dr. Cannon. Um, it was down at Sir Alexander Cannon. It had a lot of script on the top of it of various shields and that sort of thing. And um, it was an inquiry for him to come over to the island with his two young ladies, his two wards, to, um, with a view to having a holiday here and a view to buying property for them to come to when the war started. Yeah. Because they lived in Welbeck Street in London and they had lots of patients there. And uh, they needed somewhere to go to when the war started because it was obviously going to. Mm. And when they eventually arrived, I think it was somewhere about August before the war started, the end of August, and this huge, fantastically dressed gentleman arrived, uh, most imposing. And these two very lovely girls who were dressed up to the nines um, in furs and God knows what, and they arrived and stayed with us for um, two or three weeks. Now the uh, imposing gentleman was Dr. Cannon. Was and, Dr. And the, Cannon. And the two ladies? The two ladies were the sisters de Ronda. Joyce de Ronda was the younger one. And Rhonda uh, was the elder girl. And they both worked for the doctor with his medical treatments. Right. Um, mainly for diagnoses, I, I understand that um, he used to put them to sleep under the influence and they diagnosed the patients whilst they were in the land of whatever. Yes. <laughs> um, and according to what they diagnosed, so he gave them the various electrical treatments that were necessary. Well, we'll come on to that, but... Um, Balamore Castle figures initially in this story, doesn't it? Yes. Doctor said that he, they had come over with a view to buying a property and uh, they stayed for two or three weeks and the very day that they went back my mother heard about Balamore Estate at uh, Jerby mm. that was, had just been put on the market that day. So Joyce de Ronda flew straight back from London and came to see the building. We took them all around it. Beautiful gardens and lovely building. And they bought it for a fabulous sum. I think it was £8,000, mm. where you put many, many noughts behind it nowadays. Sure, yeah. But at that time, 
property was £8,000. It was good. Yeah. So we used to go out there every day. I used to go into the house uh, to help the two girls, Joyce and Rhonda. Uh, being just a little bit younger than them, we were all piled up. And Joyce and I were just like two sisters, and Rhonda was the elder sister. Yeah. And we had several holidays together, Joyce and I, afterwards, during the war. Mm. Anyway, Dad was put in charge of all the work that was to be done. And eventually, they moved over here somewhere around about the March, April of that year. And their first patients, who included several titled people, came into the ho into the hotel into the house um, in June, right. and I stayed there to do the uh, the catering and so on over the first few weeks. Yeah. Now, the he came over as His Excellency Sir Alexander Cannon with a whole lot of That's letters right. after his name That's and so on. Right. That was very impressive, wasn't it? Oh, a whole alphabet behind <laughs> his name. <laughs> it was very imposing, particularly on his letter headings. You know, he had all these letters behind his name. Yeah, um, but they weren't genuine. It turned out they weren't entirely genuine, were they? No, because the first letters he had were K G C B. Uh, which most people would think he'd been given by King George. Mm. Um, actually, it was Knight of the Grand Cross of Bethlehem that I think he'd paid about 20 guineas for it. Yeah. Most of the names that he had, uh, the letters that he had after his name, he had bought. Mm. But he did have MD genuinely. Oh, yes. He? Oh, yes, he was a genuine doctor. Yes. And a very good doctor, too, uh, for things that needed... Um, ordinary doctoring, ordinary treatment, the other things, all the electrical treatments, um, some of them have been in use and still are in use to this day. Mm. But um, at that time, he, he was just a charlatan. Eva Kane. Rhonda de Ronda and Joyce de Ronda were certainly exotic names, but Roger Sims, who did a great deal of research about Cannon and his so-called wards, tells us there were two women from the northeast of England named Joyce and Eleanor Robson, who changed their names by deed poll on the 22nd of December 1937. The names inscribed on the gravestones in Onken Churchyard are those of Dr. Sir Alexander Cannon, died 18th of March 1963, Rhonda de Ronda, who died 27th of August 1968, and Frida Eileen Butler, who died on the 15th of October 1973. When Cannon arrived to take up residence at Balamore Castle in Jerby with his truckloads of equipment, the authorities thought he could be a spy. He'd come from his own medical practice in London, where his unconventional methods had attracted numerous wealthy patients. But police files tell us that in 1940, Inspector William Neen reported that there were reasonable grounds for suspecting the commission of an offence under the, the Defence of the Realm Act of 1939. A subsequent police search of Bollamore found no evidence that he had either the equipment or the reason to be a spy. Inspector Neen described Dr. Cannon as a strange individual whose manner, speech and bearing are hardly that of a professional man. Nevertheless, Balamore was requisitioned by the military and Cannon was forced to move. The late Fred Moore was working for a firm of furniture removers who were contracted to carry out the move of the man and his possessions. Fred recalls the turn of events. But he'd nowhere actually to go at the time, so we stored his furniture in a warehouse in Ramsey. But all his equipment that he had for, I don't know, was it medical or otherwise, but he was a strange type of doctor. George Moore Ballown, the millionaire Ballown mansion, took him in. And part of the time I was concentrating, my van was loaded to go to Castletown and move the stuff, his equipment, into there. And one night when I landed down there, he had two men from across that was to uh, re-equip the stuff when he got there and set it up. And this night I got down there, evening, and they had gone to Castletown, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, doctor, I'm on my own. I don't know how I'm going to get this stuff off. He said, that's all right. And he took his coat off, and he helped and carried the stuff in with me. He was a very nice man. 
But in uh, Derby Castle, when we first went in, the thing that struck me was everywhere, every room had stars, brass stars, some were metal, some were like paper ones. Every room was covered in these stars, and it was amazing. Why did he have to go out of Balaboa Castle, though? Oh, well, he had to go to the castle. Uh, well, the war had started, and the RAF wanted that as their headquarters. Right. So he had to move. Yes. So that's why he had to go, and uh, we had the job of moving him. Did he have a lot of equipment to move? Oh, yes, there was tremendous. He'd all kinds of strange equipment. He'd one uh, machine, I remember, it just vibrated your whole body, and <laughs> he'd all different things. It's amazing. I'd never seen anything like it in anywhere before or since. After he was in Boulogne, then, did you get the job of moving him to Lauriston? Yes, my firm got that job again, and uh, we moved him into Lauriston. And uh, we moved from Boulogne, the equipment in, and then we moved the stuff from Ramsey, the household furniture and carpet and everything in, and settled him in there. One amusing thing was he had two, I don't know what you call them, figures. They were very big, they were over eight foot high. They wouldn't stand in our van. What we had to do, take the heads off them and stand them on the tailboard yeah. to get them to Douglas. And th those stood outside the building at uh, each, both at the castle and up here at uh, mm. Lauriston. They seemed to be on guard outside. He had his, I don't know whether you call them surgeries or not, but there was four or five rooms with all different equipment in. There was, wasn't a window in them. and. Uh, and if you were a patient, he would put you on the uh, bed or couch, whatever you call it. He wouldn't ask you what was wrong with you, but he had a lady with him. She was called Madame Ronda de Ronda. He would put her in a trance, apparently, and he would ask her what's wrong with you. And that's the way he worked. Well, that's one explanation from Fred Moore. Certainly throughout his time at all three addresses on the island, Dr. Cannon practiced both conventional and these alternative forms of treatment. I've spoken to several people who recall his use of what they described as cages as well as electrical apparatus and forms of light. Some suggested and insisted, indeed, that people were unknowingly questioned under hypnosis during which Rhonda de Rhonda would elicit their symptoms. A dozen or more years ago, I spoke to Ian Brunton, who went to Dr. Cannon at Lauriston. Ian was a youngster at the time, but was suffering from a nervous breakdown, and he told me about his treatments. The first time you went in, no questions were asked except, what is your name, and have you got three guineas in your pocket? And I looked at him. He said, yes, that's my fee. After being put on a bed, which was standing on glass, there was a big machine alongside, like a wheatstone wheel, connected one side to a piece of lead on the bed, and the other side to a square, um, square thing insulated to the other side of the wheatstone wheel. If you put your finger near it, you got a blue spark, just like the uh, um, magnetic yeah. um, field is supposed to look like. Yes. You got this, and occasionally it would, if you touched it, got it too far, you got a little prick. At the end of an hour, Cannon came in and said, you've got this, 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 and this wrong. Well, he hadn't examined you at this stage. He never examined me. He came in and told me what was wrong. He did not examine me at all. Um, I understand that he used Dame Ronda for the examinations, because during the actual hour you were lying on the bed, the room was in semi-darkness. There was one small red um, light going all the time. And no one else came. Yes, one sort of secretary came in about two or three times, just to see that you were all right. No questions were asked, or anything like that. You were quite young at the time, of course. Well, I was in 16 and 17. Yeah. Was it a frightening experience or not? Well, the first time my mother came in and she was with me, and um, 
that was it. But um, he he sort of came in at the end of everything and he said, well, you've got to... And then he ran off a whole list of things. But he could cure me. And I said, well, this is fair enough. I didn't believe a word of it. But I was getting pit into pretty bad state at this time. I'd just taken my school certificate and things. And, well, I didn't quite know what to do. Mm. Um... My father wasn't well, and at one stage, my father signed the cheque for me to take in for my 10 guineas weekly fee. And he said he'd never met my father, mm. but he told me exactly what was going on my father's death certificate. He died of a form of cancer on the island. In mm. fact, he died in the Kyles. Yes. And... Um, and how much later was the death following that? Nine months. H had he seen your father as a never. patient? He never saw my father at any time. How do you account for that? Using this medium. And he said that he could tell by my father's writing. Really? Yeah. Later on, during the time we were there, my mother, after my father died, I was still going to... Ca I still went for a further session... Um, he turned around to me and said, your mother is suffering from, s gave a name of something, and she needs folic acid. You've got to go and down to Boots, which was on the corner of Victoria Street, yes. and um, get some tablets. Well, they were 63 shillings a hundred. I didn't have 63 shillings to throw around. A lot of money then. So I left it. Yeah. A week later, he turned around and said, you haven't done anything about those tablets. I said, yes, I found out how much they are. <laughs> and I said, um, it's more than my bank account's worth at the moment. And so I haven't done anything about it. He said, well, here's the 63 shillings. You're to go down now and get them. Really? He'd only seen my mother's right. He'd never examined my mother, mm. but he looked at her checks when they came in, and I think the stuff was something with folic acid. Mm. And I don't really know what quite all the ins and outs, but I do know with inside a month of starting on these tablets, she had knocked off sleeping tablets, she'd knocked off indigestion tablets, and she'd knocked off practically all the things which she'd normally taken for nerves and things like that. What happened with your nervous disorder? Was that cured? That was cured. How long did it take? It took three six-week periods with um, six monthly intervals. Mm. Were you convinced then that that treatment was what cured you, in fact? Yes. Do you think that if you hadn't had that treatment... I wouldn't have been here today. I was in an awful state. And my mother didn't know quite how she was going to cope. I think the local doctors had given up on me. Those vivid recollections of Dr Cannon's treatment were from Ian Brunton. On next week's programme, we examine Dr. Cannon, the showman, his interest in magic and his enchanted hall, and of the disposal by auction of his huge collection of artefacts that he'd acquired from his world travels. <laughs>